There's stories in our life that are just, just stinking hard. It was kind of, you know, it's always kind of weird to me when Jamie stands up and talks about my grandson, my grandkids. You know, they're our grandkids. Our, our children are married. And, uh, you know, we had a, a cool time. I had the, um, I, it, I, it's hard for me to describe what it was like for me to dedicate two of my grandkids last Sunday. That was, that was just cool. And I love that kind of stuff. And then we got to spend the, the day with uh, the kids on, uh, on Monday out at Knott's Berry Farm. I was spe- expecting that to be a bad story. It turned out to be a really good story. So uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. So we have these, these, these stories, and, and, and often they're good stories. But then as, as believers, you know, we're not immune from the bad stories. You know, just, just last night, you know, someone shared something with us. Yeah, it breaks our heart. It's hard. But that's, that is the life of us as believers. We have the good stories and the bad stories, and they're all a part of what makes this life. Well, I'm going to share something today that, that sets true disciples of Jesus Christ apart from everyone else, apart from the rest of the world, and allows us to, to truly enjoy the good stories the way that we should, but also to stand up during those bad stories, during those hard things that come into our life, and do it in a way that doesn't ruin us, doesn't destroy us, as often we see the people around us being destroyed by the hard, bad things of life. We're going to finish our text in Luke 6 today. We're going to finish this this section as Jesus is, is is preaching a sermon to a very specific group of people. You know, there's a large group of people. There's thousands of people around him. But the message is targeted at a very small group. It's targeted at his disciples. And so I've been using that reality as kind of the basis for these last several messages on what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And, and, and today, I'm going to focus on our perspective. Because perspective is absolutely critical. Our perspective is how we view the world. And when we view the world correctly, the way that we should, it affects the way we respond to the stuff of life. And it allows us to stand even during the bad stories, the hard stories, the painful stories, the excruciatingly painful stories of our life. We're going to focus on this, this last little bit here as Jesus talking to disciples. And, and if, you, if you study that section as, he's, as Jesus is describing what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you realize he's not promising them sweet and wonderful and glowing times. He's not promising them big ministries and mansions and yachts and you know, fast cars. He's not promising them any of those things. Matter of fact, he's saying it's going to be ugly. It's going to be hard. But then he says something at the very end of this message that I believe if we grab a hold of this and embrace it, it will change everything. It will change your entire life. Let's pray, and then we'll get into this message on perspective. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your love. We thank you, Lord God, that even even when life is unbearable. Lord, you give us the hope. You give us the peace. You give us the joy. You give us the strength that we need to carry on. And so I pray for those who come with broken hearts, with empty hearts, with angry hearts, with crowded hearts, with whatever whatever we bring today, that, Lord God, that you would clear away the, the rubble of our life and allow us to see the rock, the foundation upon which we need to build our lives, that we might know you better, and by knowing you better, we might be able to stand through whatever storm, whatever flood comes our way. 
I thank you, Lord, for this day and all that you're going to do in it. And I pray it in Jesus' name. We're going to talk about perspective. The title of this morning's message is A Story of Perspective. You know the problem with our perspective, we, the way we view life and the world, is we always see our perspective as the right one, right? You know, we never view our perspective and say, my perspective is wrong. We never say, you know, it's incomplete. We never say it's based on, you know, wrong information. We never say that. We view our perspective as the right one and complete. I'm going to challenge that thought today. What if it isn't right? What if it isn't complete? What if your perspective, what if your view of reality, your view of things in this world is not right? What is the result of all of your choices and decisions going to be? Wrong. And it's so vital for us to understand that. Because you know, we often look at life and say, why is this happening to me? Why did this happen? Why am I going through this? Why isn't, why isn't it working out the way I want it to? Anybody but me ever think that? I was thinking about it just recently, about an hour ago. No. What was I doing an hour ago? Oh, yeah, never mind. We, we, as Jesus is preparing to conclude this sermon to his disciples, He's going to give us four things to look at, four things to examine in our lives, that if we'll examine these things, we can change the way we view the world, the way we view things, the way we view our life. You know, one of the, in one of the songs, he talked about you know, changing our heart. That, that's what we want. You know, and, and I think sometimes we forget that, that we, we forget that, that that's what we want God to do. We want him to change our heart. You know, we think, you know, I just want my life to be good. Uh, okay, yeah, that would be nice. Not real, but it's nice. What I really want, I really want God to change my heart. That's what I really want. You know, the four things, the very first thing that we have to examine in our life, if we want to see, we want to see this fruit, ultimately, that we want to see in our lives, the very first thing we have to examine is our leader. Examine your leader or leaders. Verse 39 of Luke chapter 6 says this, and he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Now this may have been kind of a a sideways dig at the Pharisees because later he's going to talk about them being blind guides. But the the point of, of what he's trying to make is that, is, that, is that, you know, we need leaders. We, we need good leaders in our lives. We need good leaders in our society. We need good leadership. And the question he would ask us, I would ask you to examine, is, is, is are, you, are you following the right leaders? Are you, are you following a good leader? Now, we, we use a term in the church that's important, and we use it a lot, and that is the term discipleship. You know, it's kind of a, you know, you know, churchy is kind of a word, but the basic idea is, it's, is discipleship is one person helping another person figure out how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Usually, the person that's doing that ought to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Would that make sense? You know, if they're a good disciple of Jesus Christ, they're probably a good person to be talking to about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You need to know who they are. You need to examine them. You need to test them to find out if they are actually a good leader. Discipleship is just helping someone else to figure out who Jesus is and how to live your life in a way that glorifies him. Disciples are not born. They're born again. It's kind of a key. You can't be a disciple of Jesus Christ without being born again. But they're not born. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said they are made. It says, go therefore and make disciples. Make disciples, not converts. A convert is somebody who confesses faith in Jesus Christ and becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, but that's not where our relationship with God is supposed to end. We're supposed to go past that and become disciples. And to do that, we need help. The Bible says so. 
You go and make disciples. He's saying, Jesus speaking to the same people he's talking to in this sermon, he's saying, you guys, go and make disciples of others. We need people to help us with that. All of us do. All of us need help to be disciples of Jesus Christ. But don't just pick anybody. You need to know who your leader is. You need to know, are they actually somebody I should be allowing to disciple me? Turn your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, as the Apostle Paul, who I believe was one of the greatest of Christ's disciples, though he wasn't discipled by him directly in in his flesh, he was through the Spirit, one of the very last things that Paul wrote right before he was executed for his faith is this, is this letter, 2 Timothy. You need to examine that person who is teaching you how to be a disciple. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2, it says this, I charge you, you know, Paul speaking to Timothy, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will pr- judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, Preach the word, focusing on the word of God. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. That verse is one of the foundational premises for why we teach the way that we do. We believe that it's the word of God that transforms lives, that allows people to grow and become disciples of Jesus Christ. Apart from the word of God, you cannot become a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is not possible. That's why you always hear guys like me saying, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Why? Because that's how you figure it all out. you got to know what God's Word says. But I want you to notice there, it's not just preach the Word. He doesn't say just teach them the Word of God. He goes on and says, convince, rebuke, exhort. You know, those are strong, strong words. Those are, those are words of, 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 you know, of, of, of challenging people in their faith. Not giving them warm and fuzzy messages to make them feel good about themselves. It's to challenge them to examine themselves and say, am I who this place in Scripture is talking about? Because that verse is followed by a warning to us that describes the world that we live in today. Verse 3, for the time will come, and I would say, I might rewrite that, the time has come when they will no longer endure sound doctrine. Who are the they? That's That's the people listening to the teaching, listening to preachers. They will no longer endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine means good teaching. Teaching that convinces and rebukes and exhorts. They won't tolerate it. They won't tolerate it. But according to their own desires, or you could insert there the word perspectives, according to their own perspectives, the way they see the world, Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth to what? To what? Myths, fables, lies. The opposite of truth is lies. We see it all around us. Brothers and sisters, we see it all around us. and, and, and And this is why what we do is so important. You know, we, you know, we don't believe that we are the only game in town, okay? You know, we don't believe we're the only church that's got it right. We, we're, doing, we're doing okay, I think. And there are lots of other churches out that are doing it right, too. But there's a lot of them that aren't. And what it's talking about here is talking about that there's a point where people will stop putting up with the kind of teaching that we do here. You know, we, we, we see it all the time. People come. They hear a couple of messages, and they say, nope, not for me. Why? Because I don't feel good about it. I don't feel good about it. It doesn't make me feel good. Pastor keeps telling me I'm a sinner. Hate to break it to you, but you are. 
And, you know, and, you know, showing up at church doesn't change that. Hopefully it makes you less of a sinner by showing up at church. In the book of Revelation, Jesus told the church of Laodicea, rebuked the church in Laodicea, accusing them of being blind and not realizing it. I believe he's talking about most of the churches in America today. Churches all around us that are blind and they don't even see it. Pastors who are blind and don't even realize it. I don't get that. I don't get that. The word appears to be so clear to me. It's one of those great griefs that I have in my life knowing that there are pastors that are not listening to what Paul said here. They're preaching sermons that are all frosting. They're all cotton candy and fluff. Turn back to Luke chapter 6. I wouldn't want to be one of those pastors come the judgment. Examine your spiritual leaders. You need them. We all need spiritual leaders. You need to have people in your life that are more mature in the faith than you are. And unless you're God, there's probably somebody in the world that's more mature in the faith than you are. And you need to find someone that can help you grow beyond where you are today because there's a point for all of us. We'll get to a certain point in our faith and we can't get any farther by ourselves. All of us, myself included. You know, not that I'm somebody special. I'm not. But we all need people to draw us deeper into the faith through those things sometimes that we can't see clearly through on our own. Examine your spiritual leader. Does their life reflect what they say? No sermon preaches louder than an authentic life. Look at the life of your spiritual leader. What does their life preach to you? Because it ought to preach the truth of Jesus Christ to you. Paul told his listeners in, in, the, in the very worldly city of Corinth, he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Saying to you, if you can't, if you can't figure it out on your own, if you're struggling, get it, because we all get to that place where we read it and say, okay, I, I, I see what it says. I understand all the words. I just don't know how to make it real in my life. Paul said, watch me. Watch me. But you know what? Before you say that, or before you respond to that, you better know who your leader is. Find someone who is following Christ, and then follow them. Follow them. But do it. Know who your leader is. Follow them into deeper faith. The second examination. Examine yourself. Verses 40 and 41. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now, the idea here is that the speck and the plank are both the same sin. And we have this, this innate ability as as sinners to see our own sin more clearly in others than we do in ourselves. That's basically what he's saying. You know, we're out, we're out there looking, checking, yeah, there's a speck in your eye, Gary. I can see a speck. I got to look around this big old plank, and if I get too close, I'm going to bang you in the head with it. But that's how we are. And he's saying, don't do that. You have focus, examine yourself, deal with the sin in your own life. Remember, in the last message, we, one of the things we said is judge not and condemn not. You know, if you're looking for specks in people's eyes, if you're looking for them, you're going to condemn them. You're going to judge them. That's just what you do when you find specks because you can see your sin in someone else much more clearly than you can see it in yourself. And God would call us, you know, before you start, before, we need, to, we need to be watching and helping people grow in their faith. The Bible tells us to draw others and help them through their sin, through their difficult thing. But he said, before you do that, you better deal with your own junk first. Clean up your own act first, 
And then you're in a place where you can help others. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, I'm going to quote him a lot today for some reason, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Examine yourselves. If you deal with your own junk, you're examining yourself, you're less likely to be looking for specks in other people's eyes. You're less likely to judge them. Third examination. Examine your fruit. Verse 43. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. The fruit he's talking about indicates the condition of the plant or tree. Here is a picture of these are these are my grapes. Uh, they're, and, and they're looking pretty pretty good, right? You know, you look at the fruit, and the fruit tells you the condition of the plant. It's one of the ways we know their fruit is healthy and, and growing and flourishing. You know, it's got good fruit on it. And that's what, that's what the Bible is telling us that we ought to be looking for. There ought to be some evidence in your life that proves you are who you say you are. In fact, the Bible says that whatever fruit is coming out of your life does prove what's inside of you. This is a problem for us often. Because what Jesus said, he doesn't put any conditions on the statement. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is in you, whatever comes out of you, is in you. If something ugly comes out of you, where did it come from? Kelly. From my son. From somebody else, right? Don't we externalize all these things? We often say the bad fruit in my life didn't come from me because I'm amazing. We externalize it. But Jesus says, no, no, it came out of you. And it's talking specifically about our words. Those words that come out of your mouth, they started in your heart. Nobody else put them there. No, they may have helped bring them out, but ultimately it was in you. Oh, we hate to hear that, don't we? Yeah, angry, harsh, judgmental. Whatever way we express ourselves. We hate to think that was inside of me. No, 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 no. It's all, it's, you know, it's that woman you gave me, God. Or something else like that. That's not true. That came right out of your heart. Here's a little tip. If you have a problem with your tongue, with your mouth, you know, especially in conversations with your spouse, here's a little tip. You want to change the way you talk? The very next time you start getting in one of those conversations you know is going to get ugly, Pull out your phone and turn on the voice recorder. Huh? How many of you would change the way you talk just by doing that? If you know you're being recorded. Huh? Yeah, you would, huh? Absolutely you would. All of us would. If I knew I was being recorded, I would I, I do it. I'm being recorded. <laughs> I'm careful. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes stuff just slips out. You record yourself, and then you go back and listen to it after you've cooled down a little bit. Go back and listen to it. Don't listen to the, to the other person. You listen to yourself. Listen to the words coming out of your mouth because they started in your heart. And the other person didn't put them there. That is what's growing inside of you. That is the plant. That is the vine. That is the tree that's inside of you. And when those things come out, that's the fruit. That comes out. That's heavy, right? Anybody? Jesus is saying you are responsible for the fruit that's coming out of your life. You're responsible for it. Not someone else, not something else. 
not some circumstance, not your upbringing, not your experience, not the bad things that happened to you. You are responsible for the things that are coming out of your mouth. Oh, we are expert blamers. You know, blame shifting is, ought to be a national Olympic sport because most of us are, are, you know, gold medalists at it. But God looks at it and says, nope. You can try to shift the blame all you want. You are responsible. To be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to examine your heart. And then you take responsibility for what you find there. Because if it's in there, you are responsible for it. Now, there'd be lots of reasons and excuses, and chances are some of those things that are in there are not going to be easy to get out. Again, that's where discipleship comes from, comes in. You're going to probably need help. Some, especially some of those deep-rooted hurts and pains or habits, all those things sometimes that get in there and they stay there for a long time. You're going to probably need some help to get rid of those things. But don't blame it on somebody else. Take responsibility for it. And then you allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the communion of the saints to help you to get out of that, to change the way that you are. Fourth and final thing, examine your obedience. Fourth and final, like I'm going to be done soon. I'm like halfway. Verse 46. Examine your obedience. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. To say, Lord, Lord, you know, again, what he's saying to you is if you say, Lord, Lord, you are claiming to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what you're claiming. When I say, Lord, to Jesus, I'm claiming that he is is my Lord, that therefore I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Does claiming to be a disciple of Jesus Christ make you one? No, No, it does not. Jesus tells us very clearly that if 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 you're claiming that, but you're not doing what he says, to use another term that he might use, you are in fact a liar. Wow, that's a little harsh. That's a little harsh, God. You've got to call it like we see it, right? Say yes. Thank you. Two of you agreed. Claiming to be a disciple doesn't make you one. Let me read, I'm going to finish a verse I read earlier, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the commandments that I, all the things I have commanded you. All the things I've commanded you. Teach them to observe. What does that mean? Teach them to obey. Teach them to obey. Who's them? Everyone. All nations. Every person that God puts you in contact with, every person he puts you in a relationship with, where you are just just being around them, exposing them to the reality of who God is, there should be some aspect of what you're doing that is showing them how to obey Jesus. Your life may be what, you may fulfill this verse just by living the life of a true disciple, just by living it. You don't have to actually say anything. You should, but you don't have to. You just live the life. Because if you're living the life, well, eventually you're going to say something. This is where perspective is so critical to us. Regularly, I counsel people with bad fruit in their life. Regularly. And where do you think they often believe that fruit is coming from? Something, someone else. Rarely, rarely does anybody, well, one, rarely does anybody come into my, into my office and say, hey, Pastor Rick, I've got to tell you about all the good fruit in my life. Let me tell you about how God is working. It happens occasionally, and you know, good things are happening around us, and so I get to hear about them. But when somebody comes to my life and they need something, there's bad stuff happening in their life, there's bad fruit coming out of their life, rarely do they see it as an issue of personal obedience. Rarely. There's always something else. There's, always another, there's a reason 
why it's happening. If only he would. And that he could be God or that he could be, you know, someone else. Then I, then my life will be better. It's not an external problem. Usually it's not an external problem. It almost always, almost always, even, even, you know, in those things where, you know, the external circumstances are not great, there's still an element where I have a personal responsibility before God to obey him. Just to believe him. I have a desire to bear good fruit on my grapevines. There's a bunch of them. And I have a desire that they all bear good fruit. Now, can I just, just leave them out there and just hope, hope for the best? No. If I want to bear good fruit and abundant fruit, there are things I have to do. And in case you're wondering... I am not a grapevine grower person, whatever that term would technically be. I'm not a gardener. I'm a pastor. He used to be a salesman. I used to be in the Navy. That's kind of my experience. There were not a lot of plants growing around in any of those things. And so to do it, I had to figure out what, how do grapes work? What do they need? And as I figure that out, I learn what they need, and then I give it to them faithfully because they need certain things. They need water, they need trimming, they need fertilizer, they need food, they need, you know, they get lots of sun. That's good. And if I'm faithful to those things, then, then I don't worry about growing the fruit. I look for the fruit. Oh, yeah, looks like they're doing pretty good. I'm doing the right things. Or I look for signs. I've got a couple of plants that are not doing so well. Okay, what's going on with those plants? I start digging in. The same thing is true with our faith. If you want to have the fruit coming out of your life, that is good, good fruit, that's the stuff coming out of us, then you have to tend the vine. John 15 tells us that the way we do that is by abiding in Christ, staying close to him. If you're close to Christ, you're going to bear more fruit. Jesus says here there are three things, ultimately, in verse 47, that helps us to bear good fruit. First, he comes to me, it says. This is the idea of having a real, vital relationship with Jesus Christ. It can't be a Sunday morning thing. It can't be an, a couple of times a month thing. It has to be an ongoing, continuous relationship with the living Savior of your soul. The more alive your relationship is with Jesus Christ, the more likely it is you're going to bear good fruit. It talks about salvation. It talks about prayer, confession, repentance. All of those things that we use to manage and, and to grow our relationship, our intimacy with God, with Christ. Second thing, here's my sayings. Well, this one you know, sounds pretty obvious. We ought to be listening to what Jesus says says here's my sayings well what is his sayings that's what he said right john chapter one describes jesus as the word become flesh which word which word is jesus become flesh the whole word your whole bible is the manifestation or the revelation of God who was manifested in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. You cannot focus on any one place in the Bible and know God or become a true disciple. The only way that we become a true disciple is to give our heart to the whole word of God. That's why you hear, again, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Why? Because it has the answers for life. It has the, the hope of eternity. It has the strength. It has all of the things that we need day by day, moment by moment, to get us to the next thing that God has for us. But there's more implied by this word here. The idea here is listening. Listening to the Word of God, not just reading it. Reading the Bible is great, but you need more than that. You know, and I believe that part of what he's implying here is this idea of listening to it being taught. 
You have to hear the Word of God being taught. Because the reality is, is none of us are experts at, at all of the Bible. God surrounds us with people that know more about the Bible than we do. And we do this in the church. That's why I stand up here and share the things that I do. So, you know, I, study, I study during the week so that I'm come ready to share something with you. God teaches me first, then I get to teach it to you, share it with you, and hopefully you take it and use it and give it to somebody else. That's what I'm hoping. But even in that, there's more to it than that. You know, again, it's important for us to go back to the very first point I said to... to to examine your leaders, you've got to be careful who you're listening to. There are teachers out there online, on some of the radio stations, on the internet, that frankly you shouldn't be listening to. They are not giving you good doctrine, and we need to be careful of that. Now, that means, and I'm not saying, just only listen to me because I'm the only person that knows. No, I don't. Just be careful. Be careful. But also, this idea of hearing here has the idea of listening with intention. You know, we, we were in the servant service. I was chatting with, um, with Deborah. And she was commenting on, you know, a, a probably a very typical wife's complain, complaint. She had told Michael something and and you know, he, he responded later. She reminded him of it. She said, I've never heard that before. And her response is, you don't listen to me. Uh, any, is there any other wife besides Kelly that would, has ever actually said that out loud? You know, us guys, we, we have this capability of actually looking you in the eye focusing our attention on you and not hearing a single word that you say. I don't know how it works. I don't know why it happens like that, but it does. What he's talking about here is listening with intention. What it means is I'm listening, and he's talking about his sayings, he's listening to the words of Christ, either as we're reading God's word or we're listening to someone teach God's word, we're listening with the reality that God is speaking. That God is speaking. When you come here on Sunday morning, come expecting God to speak to you. Because one of my prayers and one of the ways the guys pray for me is that I would be a conduit for the Holy Spirit. That God would speak through the Holy Spirit through me. And that you would hear directly from God, God's heart, directly His voice, His words, His desires, that you would hear from Him. And you need to come believing that happens and expecting it to happen for you. That God wants to talk to you. He wants to speak to you. And it could happen through the worship. It can happen through the prayer. It can happen through the reading of Scripture. It can happen through the sermon. I pray it happens through the sermon occasionally. Expect it. But you need to do one other thing too. Hearing also implies something else, that you will respond to it. Which brings us to the third thing. He says that not only will you come and hear, but you will also do. You'll do. A true disciple wants to know what Jesus says, seeks to know what Jesus says, and then once they know what Jesus says, they do what Jesus says. Regardless of how they feel about it, regardless of how they're just feeling that day, regardless of anything, they do what Jesus says. If you're going to call Jesus Lord, it means you're committed to doing what he says. Bonnie's leaving, I'm running out of time. <laughs> Great Britain has a different form of government than we do. We realize that, right? They have a different way of governing. In the past, Great Britain's form of government was a monarchy. There was a king or a queen, and, and that person ruled over the land, absolute rule over the land. They had the ultimate authority. What the king or queen said, that was law. Well, that's not the way it is today. Over the centuries, it changed, and it's been shifting 
to the point now, instead of having a monarchy, they have a constitutional monarchy. And what they have, they still have a king or a queen, and, and for reasons I may never fully understand, the world cares when one of those people gets married. <laughs> I don't get it. I mean, the whole world stops. Oh, there's a royal wedding. Like, so what? Remember, we're colonists. We don't even care about them anymore. Sorry. Sorry for you English people. <laughs> now they have a different system of government. Now their government is, they, they still have a king or a queen, but that, that ruler has no real authority in the land. Instead, all authority has been given over to the parliament. The parliament gets together. They decide what the laws are. And often, it's being influenced by the desires of the people. And so the people make these decisions. They, you know, they, they want this. They want that. The parliament gets there. They talk about it. They make a law. They take the law to the king or queen, and they, they oh, okay, I'll sign it. And that's the way they do it. You know what? That's why a lot of Christians want their faith, too. Jesus is king, right? He's king. How do you know that? Because the Bible says so. Not as he king. He's king of kings. That means he's the king in authority over every other king, president, prime minister, ruler, whatever it might be, dictator. He's the king. But what they want is they want to be parliament. I'll make the rules. I'll make the laws. I'll just bring them to Jesus, and he'll sign them. What do you think? You think he will? Eh, nope. That's the way we live sometimes, though. I'll live the way I want to, but I'll call Jesus my king. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. And what we don't understand, what we don't realize is when we try to live that way, there is a price attached to it. It is a price that is so high that if you truly understood what you were paying to live that life, you would run from it. Jesus is going to describe to us here at the end of this chapter the results of a true disciple's life, what it looks like, and the results that if you don't actually follow this path, if you don't choose the life of a true disciple, what the consequence of that is. Verse 47, again, we'll pick it up there and then read through the rest of the chapter. Whoever comes to me, hears my sayings, and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. Oh. But, oh, watch out. Watch out. When you find a but in Scripture, it's not always good. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Two men building identical houses. Two men building these things called houses. And the, and the picture, the symbolism there is the house represents their lives. All of it. Everything that you can encapsulate in your life. Everything. Your stuff, your relationships, your health, your hopes, your dreams, everything. Your entire life. Everything that you can use to describe life is bound up in that idea of house. What are you building it upon? The difference here between these two men building these houses is one of them, the first man, dug deep. Dug deep until he could get down to the bedrock, to that, to that stuff, that, that rock, that, that, that hard ground that cannot be moved, that cannot be shifted, that cannot be un undone. 
And, and for you construction guys, I know you guys know this, you know, certain areas it's easier to do that than others. Some areas you can dig like a foot and you're at bedrock. Others you're like, you're like digging forever to get to bedrock. Dug deep. Digging deep here in this context, backing up to verse 47. Comes to me, hears my sayings, and does them. That's what digging deep is. You know, dig deep involves coming to Christ, keeping your relationship alive and fresh and real. Hearing, intentionally listening for God's voice, looking for God's voice with the idea that he's going to speak to you and then as he's going to speak to you, that you're going to make a choice to respond to it. And that response is obedience. That's digging deep. foundation on the rock the picture of jesus and his word the foundation is the word of god and the word of god is founded upon and based upon and is solid upon the person of jesus christ it is harder to live the life of a disciple than any other life because you have to dig down and not just dig down you have to dig down deep that's harder right than just building on the earth. That's what he's saying. He's saying this life is hard. The life of a true disciple is not easy. It takes more work. But notice also in verse 48, when, notice it says when, not if, the flood arose. When the flood arose. Identical houses identical floods the flood hits both houses now maybe 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 you're here and you've never experienced hard things in your life maybe never never been touched by the difficult things that are just seemingly all around us never been touched by death maybe never been touched by divorce or drug addiction or abuse or neglect, maybe never exposed to violence or war, maybe never lost a job or a house, never, been, never lost an important relationship. Maybe you've never experienced hard things in your life. But I'm guessing unless you're more than an hour old, yes, you have. You have. The Bible tells us that the rain falls on the wicked and the righteous. Good things happen to both the wicked and the righteous. Bad things happen to both. They just come. Being a true disciple doesn't make you immune from the bad things of life. It doesn't. They come to you just as much as they do to anyone else. And anyone that, anyone that stands up in a position like this and suggests to you that if you become a, Jesus, a you know, follower of Jesus Christ, that your life is all of a sudden going to be perfect, is a liar. <laughs> doesn't happen like that. Life in the real world is filled with pain and suffering. Oh, there's good things. There's lots of good things. And we ought to be looking for them and rejoicing in them and reveling in those good things. But we also got to remember there are bad things and sometimes they come in immediate proximity to one another. That blows me away. How, awesome, how you can be on the mountaintop one moment and then the very next be thrown into a valley of despair. How do you live that way? How do you walk through it? How do you, how do you continue to move on and to stand in the midst of those things? And I'm sorry. <laughs> We're supposed to do communion today, and I'm out of time. I'm going to finish. Can I, have a, can I have a couple of minutes? <laughs> That's my alarm right there. The world is filled with these things. If your life is built with the foundation of the Word of God, built upon the reality 
that Jesus Christ is your Savior, is the King, then the Bible tells us that we can stand in the midst of those things. It doesn't make you immune from them. But it allows us to be able to stand in it. You know, Kelly and I have a flood story. You know, it's kind of funny how these stories kind of pop into, into my mind. We live in Menifee, and in Menifee, on the, on the property that we live on, but when years ago, they fixed it since, when it rained, it rained pretty hard, we'd have a stream of water flow across our property. You know, and when it was, when it was you know, a little stream, oh, look, we have a stream in our backyard. Doesn't everybody want a stream in your backyard? <laughs> well, when it rains really hard, that stream would become, I mean, you know, six feet deep, 20 feet wide, and in one year, it literally surrounded our house. We had water flowing all around our house. That's a little unnerving, in case you're wondering. We didn't know what, it was, what was going to happen. We didn't know what was, that, what was that doing to the house. Our house stood. The foundation was good. It was a scary time in our lives. And brothers and sisters, that's going to come. And it, it messed our place up. Our, our property was never the same after that flood. And sometimes that's the way life is. Floods come into our lives, and it messes stuff up. Sometimes so bad that it will never go back to the way it was. But our foundation was strong. And the same thing is true. If we will allow God to help us to deal with our foundation, I want you to notice something. What do you have to dig through to get to the rock? Well, if you look at verse 49, it says that, the man who didn't do the right thing built his house on the earth. And the image there, the picture there is the things of this world. If you don't dig through the things of this world, move those things out of the way. And, and that, could be, that could be man's philosophies. That could be our society's attitudes and values. It could be your own experience, your own, your own pain and suffering. If you don't move those things out of the way and get down to the bedrock of Jesus Christ, you're building your life on the earth. And when that storm comes, what does it say? What does it say about the result of it? And the ruin of that house was great. Brothers and sisters, if we're not building on the foundation, then those storms that are going to come Gosh, I wish I could promise you they won't come. But they're going to come. Eventually, the storm is going to come. The flood's going to come. And if you don't have your life built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, on the bedrock, there's it's going to be ruin. I don't want that for you. I want you to experience, I want you to be able to stand in the midst of that. Brothers and sisters, this, this, is, this is as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, as a pastor, my desire for my own life is that I would dig deep, that my foundation is so firmly established on the rock of Jesus Christ. Well, one, I want that for myself, but not just for me. I want to be that person that when the flood comes into your life and you don't know how to stand, that I can help you. And men... I would challenge each of you individually. That's on you. God would call you to build your foundation so that when the storm comes to your family, that you are the one they turn to. Now, they should be turning to Jesus, and maybe they can, maybe they will. But if they can't, you better be ready. You better have your feet planted on the rock. Because if you don't, Heaven help them. The collapse will be great. And ladies, if they won't do it, you do it. I'm going to close with one last verse, and then we'll get into communion. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. How do we do that? How do we be steadfast and immovable? We do it by digging deep. Through the junk of this world, 
That junk will always be there, but if we allow God to do a work in us, we can move all that stuff off to the side. We expose the bedrock of Jesus Christ and we put our foundation right down on top of it and then nothing can move us. Amen? Heavenly Father, we come thanking you for your grace, your mercy, your love, and Lord, I thank you for the patience of your saints, Lord God. Lord, as we prepare our hearts in communion, I pray, Lord, that we would recognize the reality of these truths, that Jesus Christ, you are the bedrock, that only upon you can we build a life that can stand. Everything else is going to get washed away. Nothing else can give us the foundation that we need besides your word built upon the bedrock of you. And so we pray, Lord, give us the faith, give us the ability to, to come to you, to hear your sayings, and to do them. We love you, Lord, and we lift up this time of communion. In